Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where you get nothing but the unvarnished truth about all things cannabis and hemp. Today's episode is a fiery one, folks, and as we do a deep dive into the heated debate over the rescheduling of cannabis, this topic has gripped the nation as policy influencers and lawmakers weigh in on this pivotal conversation. But we're going to do it. Look, since 1971, that's been over five decades, folks, cannabis has been lumped in as a Schedule One substance under the Controlled Substances Act. But there's a storm brewing in the halls of power as no less than 12 Senate Democrats are challenging that status. They've got their pens out, their letters drafted, urging none other than President Biden himself to completely remove cannabis from the CSA. And the plot thickens where we learn that the Department of Health and Human Services has thrown their hat into the ring, recommending that cannabis be reclassified to Schedule 3. The DEA, on the other hand, has been flexing its muscles, insisting that they should have the final word. And to guide us through this legislative lesser labyrinth, we'll be discussing the issue, cutting through the political jargon, and understanding what this means for you, the average Joe, you know, the small business owner, and for America. It's time to get blunt, so let's sit tight, Strap in, don't hit that return button because we're going to be talking about cannabis rescheduling right here. Now, cannabis rescheduling, it's a controversy that's got more layers than an onion, more layers than a birthday cake, folks. A group of progressive-minded you know, senators, including Elizabeth Warren, John Federer, uh, are all challenging the old norms and pushing for a monumental shift. And guess what? They're not asking for small potatoes here. No, sir. They want cannabis off the federal drug schedule entirely. That's right. Not just moving it down a notch or two, but taking it off the board altogether. Now, I've got the letter. And you know what? And this letter was penned, um, and I've got it right here. It's not often that you see this level of high of unity. It's such high profile names, including Senator, you know, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Chris and Gillibrand. These folks deem the case for removing marijuana from Schedule 1 is overwhelming. As a matter of fact, let me read a little bit of a letter for you. My, uh, this goes. This is to the Honorable Merrick Garland and the Honorable Ann Milgram, who's the Administrator, U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. Okay, and the letter reads as follows: Dear Attorney General Garland and Administrator Milgram, we write to urge the, the Drug Enforcement Administration (DEA) to swiftly deschedule marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act (CSA). The Department of Health and Human Services has recommended rescheduling marijuana from CSA's strictest schedule, Schedule 1, to Schedule 3. Earlier this month, in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, HSS for the first time disclosed its rationale for this recommendation, which made clear that cannabis does not meet the medical or scientific requirements for Schedule 1. While rescheduling Schedule 3 would mark a significant step forward, it would not resolve the worst harms of the current system. Thus, the DEA should deschedule marijuana altogether. Um, marijuana's placement in the CSA has had a devastating impact on our community and is increasingly out of step with state law and public opinion. And it goes in the background. The Biden administration has the power to reschedule or deschedule marijuana administratively without congressional action. Let me say that one more time. The Biden administration has the power to reschedule or deschedule marijuana administratively without congressional action. Under the CSA, HSS is responsible for medical and scientific analysis behind scheduling decisions, while the Department of Justice via the DEA is responsible for making final drug scheduling decisions. In October of 2022, President Biden uh, directed HSS and DOJ to review expeditiously how marijuana is scheduled under federal law. And the CSA divides controlled substances into five schedules, ranging from Schedule 1 schedule to Schedule 5. Marijuana is currently a Schedule 1 drug, a classification reserved for the CSA's most dangerous drugs that have a high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or other substances under the medical under medical supervision. Thus, Marijuana exists in the same category as heroin and more dangerous category than fentanyl or cocaine. Come on now. They put marijuana on a list that's more dangerous, saying that it's more dangerous than fentanyl? Are you kidding me? Are you seeing the number of people who are dropping in the streets all over America today? 
and they're saying that marijuana is worse than that. I don't see anybody drop it in the streets from smoking marijuana, even though marijuana is consistently found to be less dangerous than those substances and less dangerous than alcohol, which is not scheduled under the CSA at all. The scheduling decision was made against the backdrop, the political backdrop of the early 1970s, reportedly as part of President Nixon's effort to use cannabis prohibition to target and the anti-war left and black people. In response to President Biden's directive on August 29, 2023, HSS re recommended that the DA reschedule marijuana to Schedule 3. HSS concluded that cannabis satisfies the criteria for a Schedule 3 drug, meaning that it has, in quotes, currently accepted medical use in treatment, two, a lower potential for abuse in Schedule 1 or Schedule 2, and three, a possibility of abuse that may lead to moderate or low physical dependence or high psychological dependence. HSS noted that marijuana does not produce serious outcomes compared to drugs on the Schedule 1 or Schedule 2. And the vast majority of individuals who use marijuana are doing so in a manner that does not lead to dangerous outcomes for themselves or for others. Since receiving HSS's recommendation, the DEA has said that it is now conducting its review, how marijuana should be scheduled. Really? Almost a decade has passed since the DEA last considered cannabis scheduling. That was back in 2016. And the DEA decided to retain marijuana's placement on Schedule 1, despite contradictory evidence that it existed, that existed at the time. The agency reasoned that marijuana had a high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and inadequate safety for use even under medical supervision. To support its decision, the DEA pointed to a lack of scientific evidence supporting marijuana's medical use, although this created a catch-22. As Schedule One drug, marijuana is subject to the DEA's arduous research approval process and restrictions on federal research funding, which was stymie, has stymied researchers' ability to rigorously study marijuana's medical use. So at the time, HSS had reached almost the same conclusion. However, HSS has now concluded that marijuana does not meet the requirements of Schedule One drug and has identified credible scientific support for medical use uh, for the medical use of marijuana for at least some medical conditions. The DEA is bound by the HSS's recommendation as to scientific medical matters, including HSS, HHS's expert medical judgment that marijuana has a currently accepted medical use in a treatment in the United States. Moreover, experts today generally agree that marijuana has currently accepted medical use for several indications. Numerous studies have identified such medical use, including management of pain, spasms, nausea in patients undergoing chemotherapy, and to stimulate the appetite of patients with weight loss from AIDS. Studies have also found that marijuana's access has second order public health benefits. And what does that mean? The second order public health benefits, um, reducing the rates of opioid use and opioid deaths. Yes, there's a study that came out of, I think it's NYU, that stated that marijuana could be and is an exit drug to opioid addiction. <sighs> Excuse me, multiple medical organizations, including the World Health Organization and the American Academy of Family Physicians, have re recognized the legitimate medical use of marijuana. Additionally, in 2016, the FDA has approved THC and CBD based medications, including two medications containing primary compound that's responsible for marijuana's abuse potential. And in 2018, CBD is part of marijuana's chemical makeup was legalized in certain forms. And let's also remember that our federal government issued itself a patent on CBD as far back as 2002. Folks, all you got to do is go look it up. That patent is 6630507. And you can look that patent up and read the abstract, and it'll tell you exactly what the federal government believes cannabis is capable of doing. Back to the letter. Furthermore, since the DEA's last review, the landscape of state marijuana law has changed significantly. In 2016, only eight states had legalized recreational marijuana. That number has now grown to 24 states today, and 53% of the Americans now live in a state where recreational uh, cannabis can be used. This is ridiculous, you know, and Americans widespread support of medical marijuana use 
is even clearer. A total of 38 states plus the District of Columbia permit medical use of cannabis. According, accordingly, uh, thousands of doctors in those states recommend marijuana to their patients, and millions of patients consume medical marijuana under health care professionals' guidance each year. The widespread acceptance of marijuana in medical practice strengthens the HSS's, HHS's conclusion that cannabis has a currently accepted medical use, and more states will likely follow suit as public opinion continues to favor ending the criminalization of marijuana use, with 88% of Americans now in support of legalizing marijuana in some form. Furthermore, roughly 50% of Americans say that they have tried marijuana, making the federal government government's one-off arrest for marijuana possession increasingly arbitrary and inequitable. Without descheduling at the federal level and protecting state regulatory programs, consumers and workers in these states remain at risk of prosecution. So, folks, that's a letter that was written by, I think it's 12 esteemed senators sent to President Biden saying, we need to get something done. This is overwhelming. And that's not just puffery or bluster. They're citing clear scientific and public rationale and an urgent need to lift the burden of current federal marijuana policy on ordinary people and small businesses. So consider this, too. A recent survey suggests that Biden's approval ratings could soar by double digits if he sides with the HSS recommendation to take cannabis down a notch on, on scheduling. It's not just politics, folks. It's what the people want. A recent Gallup poll puts American support for legal adult use cannabis at a staggering 70 percent. That's the highest it's ever been in a half a century in this country. But as always, there are two sides to every story. The DEA is sticking to its guns, making the case that they're the ones who get to call the shots when it comes to scheduling of a substance. But there's a wrinkle here. Doesn't sound like these Senate Democrats are having any of that. They want the Biden administration to take bold action without compromise or half measures. It's a push and a pull, a bureaucratic tug of war. And caught in the middle, cannabis itself, along with millions who felt the legal and social repercussions of a Schedule One substance or status. As I, I, I pose a question to you, you know, uh, dear listeners, simply, who ought to have the final say when it comes to our right to access cannabis? While the debate over cannabis rescheduling may seem like a purely political issue, the potential impacts go far beyond just policy changes. In fact, this decision could have significant effect on the healthcare industry, the criminal justice system, and the economies across states. In the healthcare sector, Rescheduling cannabis to a less restricted category could unlock more opportunities for research and medical use, potentially leading to innovative treatments for chronic conditions in the realm of criminal justice. And before I, before I talk about criminal justice, though, if it is rescheduled to Schedule 3, I think it just opens up a bigger Pandora in the box. It depends on who you talk to, but there's one way to think this thing out. Recognize the fact that since, again, 2002, the federal government has given itself a patent on CBD. If tomorrow they reschedule it to a Schedule Three drug, which means that in Schedule Three it has to be a prescribable drug, you need a prescription to get it, that means that it would fall under the FDA. Now, why would I want to get a substance from the FDA that they have for the last 45, 50 years all claimed doesn't do anything? They've literally fought against making it legal and fought against it because they wanted to preserve some rights of the pharmaceutical industry, but they fought against it. So now all of a sudden you're going to tell me that you're going to turn over the ability to utilize this product to an organization that's hated it? How ignorant is that? And in addition, I mean, if you think about it, I I, I, I want to go the extreme. I'm not just talking about this from you know straight down the center of the road. Uh, angle, but let's go to the extreme because that's how our federal government has always been is extreme. So if tomorrow they reschedule the drug to schedule three, saying that you need to have a prescription, not a recommendation, could all of the dispensaries and across the country be shut down because they're violating state law by providing a product without getting a prescription? Very interesting. And then 
what it means that all the dispensaries are closed down would have to then sell their products through FDA approved pharmacies. And then since the FDA is the only one that gets to approve drugs that are prescribable, would the FDA then be able to come into every dispensary and basically clear the shelves and say, none of this stuff has been approved by us, so therefore you can't sell it. You just think about the quagmire this is going to just start. And honestly, the real issue shouldn't be rescheduling. It should be just descheduling. In the realm of criminal justice, this move could contribute to reducing the number of incarcerations for cannabis-related offenses, thereby ameliorating the lives of thousands of those who have been disproportionately uh, affected by current laws. Economically, a shift could open up the market further, fostering job creation, generating significant tax revenue for states. All these potential changes underscore the importance of the ongoing debate and why it resonates far beyond just the political arena. And when you think about that, remember, it was back in 2021 that we estimated coming out of the pandemic that there was $25,000 worth of I'm sorry, $25 billion worth of legal cannabis sold in America. We know that there was probably three times that in the gray and black market sold in America. If all of a sudden it's rescheduled to schedule three requiring a prescription, I will bet you that the black market and gray market is going to go back through the roof the way it used to be. And people are going to say, no, I'm not going to go down to, you know, CVS or to, uh, Rite Aid and try to buy some cannabis there from people who don't know anything about it, never, ever, ever were involved with it and never believed in its efficaciousness. Come on, man. So there goes tax dollars right out of the state coffers and the states, I think, are going to push back. The difference between cannabis rescheduling to CSA 3 and descheduling, well, when contemplating the implications of rescheduling cannabis to Schedule 3, of the Controlled Substances Act versus removing it from the scheduling system altogether, it's essential to recognize that the distinct outcomes for both consumers and businesses. Rescheduling to Schedule 3 would loosen some federal restrictions, enhancing research opportunities and possibly easing taxation burdens on cannabis businesses. This change could lead to reduced prices and increased accessibility for customers, as well as more straightforward banking and financial services for companies within the industry. Despite the potential for the potential advancements that reclassification of cannabis to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act might bring, there remain several concerns for both businesses and consumers. For businesses, reclassification might reduce some regulatory burdens, but it does not eliminate them. Businesses would still face significant federal limitations, especially in areas like advertising and full-scale interstate commerce, which could hamper growth and innovation. Additionally, the stigma and legal ambiguity surrounding cannabis might persist, affecting banking relationships and insurance availability. For, for consumers, reclassification of Schedule 3 still signals federal oversight and control, which might limit the types of cannabis products available and keep prices artificially high due to the ongoing regulatory and tax burdens. Furthermore, it does literally address the social justice issues stemming from past cannabis convictions. Many individuals live lives have been significantly affected by cannabis schedule one status and simply moving it to schedule three might not fully rectify these injustices or facilitate the expungement of records. These lingering concerns underscore the complexity of, cannab of the cannabis issue and the need for a holistic approach to reform. On the other hand, Completely descheduling cannabis would eliminate federal prohibitions, treating cannabis similar to alcohol and tobacco from a regulatory perspective. For consumers, this means access to cannabis would significantly broaden, potentially increasing the variety and quality of products available. Businesses, particularly small ones, would benefit from an even greater reduction in regulatory hurdles, opening up interstate commerce possibilities and attracting investment without the fear of federal intervention. This comprehensive approach addresses not only the legal implications, but also paves the way for substantial economic growth and social justice reforms related to previous cannabis convictions. This topic has repeatedly sparked debate nationwide, and it seems like every player from health authorities to political figures has something to say about it. But here's a new twist in the tale. 
U.S. Rep. Andy Harris of Maryland, known for his firm stance against cannabis reform, is now actively trying to influence the DEA to maintain cannabis as a Schedule One substance. That's right. He's playing his hand to keep cannabis on the list alongside drugs like heroin and ecstasy. Surprising? <laughs> Hardly given his history. We're talking about the guy who back in 2015 threw a wrench in Washington, D.C.'s plans to manage adult use sales by drafting the infamous Harris Rider. His latest move, a letter directed at the DEA Administrator Ann Milgram, despite the Department of Health and Human Services suggesting a reclassification to Schedule Three based on new analysis. Now, according to Harris, this eight-factor analysis by HSS in partnership with the FDA is flawed. How so? He claims they ignored crucial factors, one being the everyday use of cannabis and its addictive potential, traffic incidents due to impaired driving, which is something that you can go back as early as 2000, I think it was uh, 2000 itself, when the Clinton administration, then with General McCaffrey, published a study, and I believe it was out of one of the universities out of Southern California, showing that there was no increased impairment for driving or no potential for driving out greater driving accidents because of cannabis use because people seem to drive slower and be more concentrated when driving under the influence that's just a study that came out over 22 years ago 23 years ago and they also where he was also complaining about the effects on pregnant women and children and the list goes on and on all under examined according to harris now but harris doesn't stop there he leans on the 1961 single convention on the narcotic on narcotic drugs, drug treaties to argue that cannabis should remain a Schedule I or Schedule II drug. And if we want to go back to that UN treaty, in the last four or five years, well over 150 countries have pulled out of that treaty uh, and asked for uh, cannabis to be allowed to be traded internationally. And as a matter of fact, in the last year, I think the tonnage of cannabis being shipped around the world went from almost zero to tons in the last two to three years. Yet, even as international perceptions shift to acknowledge the legitimate medical use of certain cannabis products, Harris seems set on his trajectory. He didn't miss the chance to accuse the FDA of bias, suggesting that they picked harmful drugs as comparators to downplay cannabis' risk while ignoring substances like Adderall and Ritalin. He's requesting responses to a handful of pointed questions looking to add pressure to keep cannabis as it is on the controlled substances list. We have posted links to both of these letters in the episode description in case you want to check them out for yourself. How this will play out is anyone's guess, but we've got our eye on the DEA's response, and we can't ignore the fresh outlook the armed services have taken towards cannabis use. Relaxing their stance on previous cannabis consumption for entry candidates marks a notable shift, reflecting changes in society's approach to cannabis. The U.S. military has historically taken a stern stance against drug use among its ranks, but things are starting to change. Though it's not changed for use among its ranks, the Air Force has introduced a policy that reflects a new understanding of cannabis. The Air Force's marijuana waiver program um, uh, has struck a chord, drawing attention with a surprisingly high uptake, designed to give applicants who test positive for THC a chance to clean up and retest the Air Force projected its modest waivers would be only maybe 50 waivers a year. But to their surprise, they've granted over three times that number just in the first year. Despite this guidance and this guideline, the guideline remains clear. Drug use is not tolerated in the armed forces, no. Yet the Air Force recognizes the value of second chances, particularly involving the legal landscape. While the novel, while novel, this approach aligns with recent findings that prior cannabis use doesn't diminish a soldier's performance, such that it challenges the stigma and could pave the way for further policy adjustments. Though I'm sure that the military will never allow for cannabis use while on active duty, because we have so many states that have passed laws, 58 of them, sorry, 30 of them and the District of Columbia, the pool of new accessions comes from a pool of people who have grown up understanding that cannabis could be a medical, uh, have medical efficaciousness or even adult use. You know, you can't hold somebody, 
you know, to the fact that, you know, up until their 18th birthday, they were using, and then they decided to enlist in the military. And if they decided to enlist in the military, now the regulations that the military has put on them apply. The military is right now having a serious recruitment challenge and problem with only a quarter of young Americans eligible for service, often due to health, fitness, or substance use issues. With recruitment numbers dwindling, the Navy, too, joins the Air Force in reviving its approach or revising its approach towards cannabis, acknowledging the shifts in Gen Z's lifestyle choices, less alcohol, and more acceptance of cannabis, and a desire for independence. These policy shifts mirror a generational change in attitudes towards cannabis and highlight the adaptability within our military protocol. By acknowledging these societal tra transformations, the military is positioning itself to engage a new wave of recruits who reflect modern values and outlooks proving that even the most established institutions are not impervious to change. And as we wrap up today's conversation, we can't help but cast our eyes overseas, where Germany has stepped forward in their progressive stance on cannabis by legalizing for adult use. This is big news, reinforcing the global change we're witnessing as more nations recognize the need for updated policy for reflecting, understanding, and the use of cannabis. The German parliament just rolled out a new law allowing anyone over the age of 18 to enjoy recreational use of marijuana. Sounds straightforward, right? Well, hold your horses just a minute. The move comes with a heap of restrictions that might make it tougher than you might think to light up a joint. We're talking about a future where puffing pot in many public spaces will, be, will get a green light starting April 1st. Imagine carrying around 25 grams, which, my friends, could mean dozens of joints, or dozens of bowls without the care in the world, at least in public spaces. At home, you can stop, stockpile double that amount. In some parts of Germany, like Berlin, cops have, have been known to glance the other way when it comes to public smoking sessions. But until now, Germans carrying cannabis just for the fun of it faced being dragged in and being dealt and having to deal with the legal system. Health Minister Karl Lauterbach is steering this ship of change. Aging, aiming to snuff out the black market and safeguard users from tainted weed and chop down the income tree of organized crime. But don't expect to walk into cannabis cafes on every corner tomorrow. The road to this historic vote was a very bumpy one with years of heated debate. Doctors and conservatives voiced their alarm about the potential harm to young minds, arguing that legalization could spark a rise in usage. The bill did pass, though, with a large majority. But wait, it's not as easy peasy as it may seem. No smoking in your schools or sport facilities, folks. And purchasing, well, that's a different game all to itself. The initial plan for licensed shops got axed over EU, EU, EU concerns that it might turn Germany into Europe's dealer of choice. Enter cannabis social clubs. These nonprofit groups can grow and share a bit of their bud among their members. But their caveats no smoking on site, a cap to 500 German residents per club, and your home garden can only feature three of your very own cannabis plants. Sounds like a little bit of a paradox, doesn't it? Allowing substantial possession, but then making the buy a little tricky. Sure, the regulars might be all set, but what about the casual users or the tourists? Critics think the black market will keep booming just the way it has. And this show is just getting its pilot season. The German government, government plans to assess the effects of the new law over the next few years and could later greenlight the licensed sale of cannabis. But given the ruckus until now, folks, uh, there is nothing set in stone. Some conservatives even plan to uproot the entire law if they win in next year's elections. So don't hold your breath for Germany turning into Europe's next Amsterdam, not just yet. And that sparks another burning question. How does Germany's, Germany's leap towards cannabis legalization affect the broader picture in Europe? With Germany being one of the largest economies in the EU, this significant policy shift might just set precedent that other countries could feel a growing pressure to follow. But it's not just about the economy. It's also about the culture, health, and social fabric. If the German experiment proves fruitful, reducing crime rates and creating a safer environment for cannabis consumption, we might see a domino effect across the entire EU. 
However, Europe is diverse, with each country holding its history, culture, and stance on drug policy very close to the heart. The path to legalization or decriminalization might evolve uniquely in each jurisdiction. We're going to keep an eye on this space, folks in Europe, and see how Europe navigates these high waters. This episode isn't just a tale of reform. It's a reminder that legalization is more of a labyrinth than a freewheeling party. It's crucial to consider the implications, the regulatory hoops, and the ongoing debates that shape the cannabis landscape. Stay informed my friends, because discussions like these help us understand the complex nature of cannabis policy and its ripple effect across societies. This has been Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Keep your conversations lit, your minds open, and we'll catch you the next time when we dissect another blazing topic. See you on the next Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.